thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. By day or by night, your sleeping, thy presence, my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. I, thy true Son, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, man's empty praise, thou mine inheritance, thou and always. Thou and Thou only, first in my heart. High King of Heaven, treasure Thou art. Amen. All right, you guys, you up for another couple of, a couple of stanzas? How about 452? Do a couple of these. 452, my Savior's love. We'll sing uh, oops, one and one and two. Should be good. 452. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he would love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous wonderful and my song shall ever be oh how marvelous wonderful is my Savior's love for me me it was in the garden he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs but sweat drops of blood for mine. Oh, how marvelous! And my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous is my Savior's love for on four, on four, he took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous! And my soul shall ever be. Wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Very nice. Very good. All right. That was good. That's my that's my choice. <laughs> All right. A couple of uh, prayer announcements. We'll get started. First of all, I was informed good news. You like good news, don't you? Yeah. It's, like, it's good to be able to give good news sometimes. Gospel is good news. But life sometimes is difficult. But the uh, good news is that Renee doesn't have cancer. Amen. Oof. Thank gosh. So whatever that, that lump or that abrasion in her breast was a result of the accident. So long story short, thank God. Amen. So I don't know what else is going to be going on for as far as treatments. I mean, she doesn't, she's okay. It was bruised, that was it. Okay, well, that's good news. And uh, Rose had asked to pray for 
a gentleman, Eddie, who works for her, her grandson? Okay. And he was in a car accident, you said. So, Eddie, and you said Eddie saved? As far as you, okay, good. Okay, well, pray that Eddie, would, you, God would help him. He got hurt, he was in an accident. Hopefully he's not injured too bad. And Thank God he saved. And pray through this, God would direct him and show him. But sometimes accidents happen. We don't know exactly the cause, why God allows these things. But for Eddie, the, a Christian, we pray he'd protect him and direct his steps where he needs to be. So we'll leave that at that. Amen. And any update on Brother Ray? Megan, no? Oh, I saw him yesterday. We were there for a good, good couple hours. Okay. Nice visit with him. So he's just, gonna, he's just hanging in. Uh, keep praying for Brother Ray. And I mean, uh, you know, it's hard sometimes to go by what you see. So we're just going by faith that, yeah, he's, he's sick. You know, he's going through it. But he's got a good spirit. And uh, staying positive and doing what he has to do. So uh, we're just praying that this will all, uh, this will all be you know, a past memory. So, all right. I think that's uh, some something else. Something else. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter twelve. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Call it the message tonight, I'm going to make a note of it back there, fellas. It's called the words of truth. Words of truth. That's an expression that shows up a few times in the Bible. Not, not all that often. So where it shows up, it's pretty unique. As a matter of fact, this verse kind of jumped out at me today. You know, having read the Bible a number of times, and I came across this, and it, it just hit me. I look at this verse in Ecclesiastes 12.10. It's an interesting, interesting wording, and it spoke to me. Uh, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Look at that. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let them be acceptable. Well, the idea is that if you're using God's words, they are acceptable. They're acceptable. All of God's words are acceptable. And it says the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, let's pray right now. Ask God to help us. All right. Uh, Brother Rob, how about you us, lead us in a word of prayer? hear your word and learn from your word, Lord God. And I pray for pastor, but I just pray that you have the spirit upon him and that he can speak unto us your truth, Lord God. And give the ears, uh, excuse me, give the church, uh, I pray that you have your spirit upon us and give the church ears to hear what your spirit has to say, open hearts and minds to receive your word. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Acceptable words, and it said the preacher sought to find out. That's what I do. I seek to find out acceptable words all the time. I had another message for tonight that I prepared a while ago. I haven't been able to preach it yet because I was going to use it. And then I was reading and praying today, and I, I felt I said I'm going to go with this one. But the point is, um, I'm always looking for acceptable words, and I know that God's words are acceptable. I'm going to give you three things about God's words. Number one, they're acceptable. Uh, number two, they are absolute. And number three, they are authoritative. Amen. And that's what scares people away sometimes. But the fact that they're acceptable is a good thing for us to remember, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, when we use God's words, even in witnessing, for instance, and you're going to necessarily not have time to preach a message to somebody, you might just give them a track, which is fine. You might say something that God puts in your heart, maybe a, a Bible verse or just a quick statement from the Word of God, 
There's a lot of little things you could say. Uh, and, and then it, it, there's something about those words being acceptable. So lately, my wife's been using one that really, she likes it and it works well for her because it's very natural for her. And she'll address somebody and say, by the way, I don't know if you've ever heard this. And she even talked to a couple of doctors today at the, when she drove Kitty, dropped Kitty off at the, in, in, uh, to the dermatologist. And a couple of the assistant doctors were there. And she said, you know, you were young, young. And she said, I don't know if you guys ever heard this, but, uh, and then she goes to quote John 3.16. Did you ever hear that, that God so loved the world? And then she quotes the word of God. So they go, no, I never heard that. So then she says, okay, well, can I give you something to read? Yes. It'll explain that. But what was interesting about that is it's natural for her to say that because it's a scripture. And God's words are what? Acceptable. And, and they'll accept it. But at the same time, they're acceptable to God. Like they're, you're saying the right words. Those are the right words to say. I'm not saying every witness has to be like that. But at some point when you do speak to somebody, at some point it gets back to the word of God. Whether you're telling it that or they're going to read it in the track or you give them something to muse about, and it, they're acceptable. So that's what you, we, we want to, like, so, like David said, like I said, uh, the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer. God, help our, how are our thoughts and our meditations acceptable? One, well, we've got the words of God, the words of truth in us. The words of truth in you will make you to be acceptable in God's sight. Very important. Uh, I'm, I'm searching out scriptures, reading, praying meditating all the time on how to, how to bring something out, how to, what to say, how to, you know, I don't plan it out as I speak, it comes out, but I give myself an outline and prepare my thoughts and pray that God gives me an unction to properly put it all together. Preaching is a, preaching is a strange phenomenon that takes place. It, it's an art, it's um, a skill that you develop, and it's from God. And it's, you can learn, you go to school, you learn preaching. And no, you can't learn, you learn about preaching by maybe going to a Bible school. You, you don't learn how to preach. You learn how to preach by preaching. And there's, there's no other way around it. You can learn, you know, hermeneutics and, uh, and, and the right terminology and how, how to, the style of preaching. But that comes with time. I was explaining to somebody recently, I said, teaching was something that, you know, early on I, I was able to do. That came to me quickly. That was... That was natural. It was learn, teach, explain it. But preaching, yeah, okay. I mean, and this person I'm talking to says, well, you've always been a really good, a great preacher. I said, well, thanks for saying that, but I don't feel that way. I think I'm becoming a good preacher now. It took, took many years. It's an experience. And this person was saying that, you know, uh, you know, she wants to help her get better at writing, and she's not a great writer. I said, I think you're a very good writer. You know, I happen to think she's a good writer. And she's, uh, you know. I said, it's no different than, you know, you can't compare yourself to Ernest Hemingway. I can't compare myself to D.L. Moody. So, you know, you are who you are, but I, I know that preaching is something that you develop over time. And yes, through experience, and when you're sincere and sold out to the Word of God, then it all, it all comes together. Because, you know, God wants to use that vessel that's committed to Him. No question about it. Because I, I mean, when I preach, 90% of it I have, 85%, I don't know, sought out, thought out. But as I'm preaching, maybe less, 75%, it, things will come out that I didn't plan on saying. And that's the Spirit leading you and directing me. And that's, and that's how you know that God's involved in it. And it, it, is a, it, is a, it is a gift, and it's a strange, but it's something that you have to, you have to God. You can't just say, I'm going to be a preacher. And you could say that, but God has to give you the green light. Amen. Brother Lynch, he, he made me laugh. He used to say funny things. And I remember him saying, well... I don't know what good preaching is, but I know what good preaching ain't. <laughs> that was one of his famous lines I used to crack up, you know. But th that's, that's part of what happens. It takes time to develop. It's like anything else. You develop, you, you, you practice an instrument. You, you develop a skill, whatever it is, and you become adept at it. Well, there's no different than preaching. But the difference is with preaching, it's spiritual. And there has to be a spiritual connection between that person and God. You could be an orator and not a preacher. So, but some aren't even good orators. Yes, yes, correct. You could be, exactly, you could be, the, the best politicians are backslidden preachers. You know, the, good, the good orators, the good orators, and they know how to use their voice and inflection and their emotion to get that across. 
Whereas some are just good orators. They could speak well, but, you know, and, and they're articulate and they make a point, but they're not preaching per se. Uh, they're explaining things. And that's, all, that's too, but preaching is a little different. And again, acceptable words. What makes, what I know that God can do through me is I'm committed to using his words. I'm going to bring my opinions into some degree. I'm going to bring in my experiences because that's that you have to. It shapes the, who you are. But ultimately, my message, the meat of my message is the word of God. That, that's what I've spent studying and meditating and reading for years to put that out. Uh, so, the, again, the, word, the words of God are acceptable. I had somebody call me the other day. <clears throat> He's a Christian. He, know, he knows me for years. He doesn't come to church. He used to come here once in a while. You know, you meet a lot of people. And I, I don't waste time over that. Come where they go. You, you want to come? You don't come. I, I've got to tell you. Uh, but, but he had a Bible question. So he called me. Because he, he knew I know the answer. So he says, I know you know the Bible. Well, okay. Gee, thanks. Okay, what's your question? And then, you know, proceed to tell him the answer. We talked, and he appreciated it. And he's a nice fella. But he goes to this other church. I said, well, that's nice. I mean, I don't know what, what I'm going to tell you. It's the, I, I get the craziest call sometimes from people. I say, well, I'm calling you because I know you, you, you know this. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Right, got it. Exactly. You know, it's like, you know, you, you want to learn? Go to where you're going to learn. Go to where you get fed. But oftentimes, it's really... It, they might not want to. Oftentimes, exactly. They, yep, they're comfortable with, and, and I'm not picking on this guy specifically, but anybody in that vein, they're, they're comfortable with knowing truth, getting saved. Here, here's the verse. Here's the verse. Um, knowing, was de but denying the power thereof. The, knowing the Lord, but denying the power thereof. A form of godliness, thank you. But they deny the power thereof. And that's what it is. It's a form of godliness, but denying, that's it. They'll get it. They'll go to church. They'll praise the Lord. They get saved. And they deny the power of God. Cause they, no, that's, that's a little too heavy for me. That's, I, I, I'll, you know, I'll dabble around it. And I'll get something. I'll get what I need when I need it. Because I, I had a need and I needed, I needed an answer. And he got the answer that he wanted, which happened to be biblical. So he was happy. <laughs> you know, what, what if it wasn't what he wanted? I don't know. I mean, then, then it would have been a different story. But the thing is that acceptable words are very important to understand that God's words are acceptable. The burner that's witness is a good example because she's using the word. I'm not saying every witness you have, you have to use the word that way. But at some point, in other words, at some point when you were witness to or you believe that God spoke to you, it had to do with the word of God. The words of truth sunk into your soul somehow some way you read them you heard them someone spoke them to you uh, and then it started to resonate in your spirit you don't understand we don't understand that we're like spiritually dumb we don't get it at the beginning and we were like well, what's that you know sometimes it uh, it doesn't matter the level of intellect it matter it matters the heart attitude so well what's that what does that mean it's a simple version it, it takes a while the eyes get open the eyes of your understanding being enlightened and knowledge of the truth. So that's the first thing I'd like to say is that number one um, about the word of God is that they're acceptable words. And, and know that your Bible is acceptable to God. It's acceptable. The, look, church, it's, it's acceptable. It's like if you have a, a pass to try to get in somewhere, it's, that's not acceptable. That won't work. No, It's not valid. This will work. This will get you in. So number one, it's acceptable. Number two, they're absolute. Turn to Proverbs 22, please. Right behind Ecclesiastes. Proverbs 22. Okay, Proverbs 22. Look at verse 20 and 21. Keeping in mind the thought tonight is the wor are the words of truth. The words of truth. Okay, look at his verse here. <clears throat> Have not I wit written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that, and he, yes he did, it's the Bible, right? That I might make thee know, not guess, know the certainty of the words of truth. 
that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send them to thee. Wow. It's not guessing and it's my opinion or what my religion teaches. That's the, uh, that every good Christian understands that when they were giving an account of their faith, let's say, or trying to explain somebody. And they'll say, well, that's your religion. That's your belief. And it, well, th yeah, it is my belief. Correct. But it, it, my belief isn't what makes it important. What makes it important is what God's word says. Now, if I, if I choose to believe it, then I'm in good company. If you choose not to believe it, you're in bad company. But it's not like it's, I've made this up. I invented this doctrine. I'm just showing you the words of truth. If you choose to believe it, good. But look at that. Knowing the certainty of the words of truth. I have no doubt that the words of God are, the, the words of the word of God, the Bible. What you have in front of you, the King James Bible. This truth. It's absolute truth. That's what it said. The certainty of the words of God. Certain. If they're not certain, if you don't know they're certain, how do you know that what you're hanging on to is true? You don't. What, how, how do you get saved by grace through faith, the gift of God, not of works of the man? You we love that verse. What if it's not true? What if they're not certain about it? Well, I'm certain about it. Amen. These things that I've written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Not guess. And it's certainty of those words that gives a Christian authority and power, which I'll get to in a moment. But before you could have authority, you have to have an absolute. And the absolute is the word of God. Amen. And you have that absolute. Now, here's a great example. Turn to, I'm going to give you a good Bible example, but turn to Proverbs 30 for a minute. Look at another one. So 22, 20 and 21, great verse again, that I may make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. In other words, answer with Scripture. Right. It's not your opinion. It's not my church teaches this or we believe. Well, you might teach that. Your church might teach that. And it might be right. It might be wrong. What does the Bible say? Well, say, I mean, say, well, I don't know. Well, then figure that out before you try to give an answer. Otherwise, say, just say, I don't know. I'm, I'm a young Christian, or I don't, I'm not that well versed in it, but from what I understand, I know the church I, church I go to, here's how they believe. And that's okay, you can say that. You preface that. You don't even, and then everybody has to be a walking Bible scholar. You say, well, I'll preface that. And then, you know, you take it from there. Look at Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Talking about absolute, watch. Every word of God is pure. Say amen. He is a shield of them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be find the, found a liar. Amen. Don't, very simply, don't mess with the word of God. Amen. That was the, the, the question you had a while ago. What happened to that king? Yeah. That's, why he got, that's why he got cursed. That's why he got, that king that did it right. Um, the Jehudi was listening to the... Jack and I, exactly. He got cursed because of what he told Judy to do. He chopped up the word of God and got cursed. And that's why nobody from his seed could sit on the throne. So, you know, the idea is don't mess with the word of God. Well, the Bible translators say they're not messing with the word of God. No, how dare you say that? They're, we're bringing, giving you a better, more clear rendering of the word of God. That's what they say. And, and they say that to make money off the new translation. Isn't it? Isn't it strange? The only, you, 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 oh, I mean, hopefully you know this. I think most of us know this. Some of us might not. The only Bible in the world, listen, in the world, that doesn't have a copyright is the King James Bible. You say, wait a minute. What is My Bible? No, your Bible, Thompson Chain, Nelson, Church, whomever, that would be a copyright for the editor who put that together. Footnotes, footnotes, maps, and, and, they, 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 and they say that. But if you literally wanted to, let's say, copy, you know, uh, 30 chapters out of the NIV, and I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you ever did, you would need, a, you need written release from the, or from the publisher of the NIV to, to give you authority to do that. If you want to copy the King James Bible and, and just photocopy, make, you can hand it out. There's no copyright. Why is that? 
Because the motive behind the King James Bible was to put the Bible into the hands of the common people so they could learn and understand. Amen. They could understand the certainty of the words of truth. And it's so simple when you get, when, when, if people just hear these truths and I'm not making this up. This is fact. Like, people can't get a hold of it. They, well, well, these other guys translate the Bible. They love God too. Please save your story. Whether they love God or not, I don't know. I know they might make money off it. Some do, some don't. I can't speak for everybody. But I know that when you, they go in these translation committees, six of them and six months to come out with a Bible. There's something up with that. Yeah, well, now talk about the other. Yeah, and he wants to play with the words. So the first thing, the first statement the devil makes in the Bible, not the first statement he makes in, in history, but recorded, Genesis 3.1. Satan was more subtle, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And his first thing he says to Eve, Yea, hath God said? First thing that he speaks, if that doesn't clearly show us his motive and his methods and his, you know, the, 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 the law first mention, that the first time he speaks, it's to challenge the authority of God's word. What did he say? That's his mission. That's his goal. And he has succeeded. He has succeeded in that Christendom today, throughout the world, is mixed up. There is. The, the, the fact that we have the King James Bible is beautiful, but it's mixed up. Because it's a battle that you can't really win today. Individually, you might be able to help show a couple of people, but the, 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 the masses have gone the other way. And it's just a matter of holding on. I'm not saying they can't get saved by using another Bible. I don't, I don't believe that. Because salvation is between you and God. Amen. You could say by reading a track. Does that make it a Bible? Yeah. Sir. So that's silly. You could say by witnessing to somebody. You, when you quote the scripture, you think you always quote the scripture just 100% right? Sir. <laughs> no. I know I don't. <laughs> and I'm pretty good. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's still honor because he knows what you're getting. He knows the point. And you're not trying to change it to, to make merchandise of it. You just misquote it. Absolute, absolute. Watch this. When, uh, when King Ahasuerus made a decree court for Haman to kill all, the, all those Jews in the time, 127 provinces, on the 13th of Adar, he already wrote it into lo royal, uh, royal decree. And once it was uncovered that he was duped into doing this because Esther is a Jew and he's going to have to kill her, he realized, oh my gosh, when it was uncovered with Mordecai, what happened? Well, can you undo it? Can you just simply undo it? No, I can't undo it. I can't undo the law of the Medes and the Persians. He's the king. What great typology, though. You can't undo the words of the king. So what he did was make another decree to counteract the first decree to give the Jews authority to defend themselves on the same day. Therefore, they had the upper hand, and they won. They killed 75,000 plus another 800 in Shushan, the palace. So the point is, they won. And they won by defending it with the sword. With the what? Sword. Word of God is what? Sword. sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Oh, it all comes back to it. And the typology is beautiful in the whole thing, even though that was literal, physical killing. The typology for us works perfectly. But think about this for a minute. The king couldn't change it, so he makes another decree to offset it. Well, that, that works well. Understand this, that once it's written and it's been authorized by a king, King James Bible, Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is what? Power. It's the only one in the world. And you can't alter it. People could change it and, and make thousands of uh, renderings and different uh, versions. That's not going to change. That's happening. That has happened. It won't change. That doesn't affect the truth of the words of God. All right? And yeah, so and here's the thing. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth and purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation for what? Ever. Psalm 12, 6, 7. What a great verse. 
he's going to preserve the words of truth from this generation forever. The words of truth. Somebody asked me recently, how do you explain to somebody, you know, what's a good answer about how do you know? You know I said simply this. You say, do you believe that God created the universe? Oh, yes, because they're Christian. Yes. You believe that. It's pretty powerful. Do you, do you know how he did that? Oh, no, I believe that by faith. That's good. Well, do you think the God who created the universe by faith can also write a book and preserve it without error? Do you think he could do that? I mean, is, is that silly? Why can't he do that? Oh, you say, well, man's involved. I understand that man will try to mess it up, and they do. But can he keep something <laughs> pure? You better believe it. And he did. And we have it. Thank God for that. Here's a thought. Here's a thought. Absolute words. The, what are the, word, the words of truth there? Um, acceptable. And they're absolute. You know, you have to have an absolute. You have to have absolutes to even for like, and anything is a measuring point um, for time. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time has an absolute point, And you, all time is measured from Greenwich, England. East or west, depending on what you know. That's how you time zones of the world. We know that. Well, absolute zero in terms of uh, temperature. You know, we always have to have something that's absolute that we could base something on, base our facts upon. Here's, an instant, here's a good thought. We're living in a world today that increasingly is becoming um, digital. It, everything is, is online and there's some benefits, I'm not denying that. But what we have is a, it's becoming, leading towards a cashless society. You know what, watch. Almost like losing a paper trail. Now, some could argue, and I'm guilty, and you're probably guilty too if you're honest, that you maybe pay some of your bills through online. I mean, I do, I don't pay all of them, I do pay some. I don't know if you guys do, maybe you do, some of you do. It's the way the world's going. So you accept, it's easy, it's fast. There's some benefits for it, especially if you're going to make a late payment. Yeah. You get, before you get a late payment, you have to do it quick. You can't mail it. It's not going to get there. So you do it online. Point is, there's some benefits. I know that. But at the same time, I know there's a detraction, downside. What's the downside? The downside is no, eventually no cash. Eventually no paper transaction. Everything is a computer chip. Everything is monitored via the uh, cyber security or cyberspace. And, and, and what you, then, then what happens when that system crashes? Well, how, how can you prove what you have? You, I just said recently, I was saying a while ago, who I, who I believe is very instrumental in end-time events. It just so happened to be that Facebook is coming out with a global currency that wants to be in place by the first, year, first half of 2020. A global currency called the Libra coin, or Libra something, because balance, scale, fairness, equality. For the world, so, I mean, you know, sometimes you've got to look at these things with, with the rose-colored glasses not to see the truth. Revelation 13 is very simple. It talks about, when you don't take that mark, you can't buy or sell. Global currency, not the Bitcoin, that came out with a cryptocurrency, but it, this is going to be accepted worldwide. That, well, that's the goal, to get it accepted worldwide. It's worldwide. If you want banks, countries behind it, to give it authority. What, what, makes, you, what, what makes you think your, your cash is valid? It's valid because... No, it's valid, yeah, it's valid because the government says it's legal tender. Correct. That's all it's valid. It's legal tender. They say it's legal tender. If they say it's not legal tender, then it's worthless. Yep. It certainly isn't worth anything in terms of being backed by gold or precious metals. So it's paper money. But the point is, as long as our government says it's legal, uh, fine, we accept it. But th if they get the world, I'm not saying this is it right now, but he is certainly at the forefront of introducing something that's what the Bible talks about, worldwide currency. That you could deal with someone in China or deal with someone in Africa. It doesn't matter. You've got, you don't have to change into that currency. It's just, accept this. Almost like what Europe did with the euro. Well, the European nations, w with, with some exception. Well, it's leading to that. 
so that you'll eventually won't have paper. You know, a lot of times even people will come to church and they'll, I'm not, I mean, you know, I accept, they appreciate they're here. They'll look on their iPad or their phones and they'll follow along. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm saying that's the way it's going, right? A lot of preachers will, I, I see these guys, they'll, they'll stand and they'll have their, on the iPads and they'll use it, right? Get rid of the book. So eventually this becomes, what are you, what are you carrying that for? Oh, you, no, no, you can get, the, the, I have Bible apps on my phone. I use them all the time. To reference things, if I can't get that, where is that, real quick. Yeah. I'm not shading that. For the, I'm not reading that. I mean, occasionally I'll read it for a reference, but I'm reading this. Amen. You know what I mean? And that's why I thought, I thought that that movie that Denzel Washington made, who's a Christian, uh, The Book of Eli, a number of years ago. A terrific, terrific movie. It's a movie. I understand it's not completely factual. It's a movie. But it was enjoyable. I liked it. It could get to that point. And it's... It, it, so it's almost like you're watching it. You're watching the tribulation, it looks like, right? Yeah. That's the idea. And as you're going, and, and, and the whole point is he's carrying this valuable book the whole time, and nobody knows what it is. They're trying to kill him, and he's fighting back, and he's blind all, all, all the while. He's blind, and he's incredible in the movie. And then at the very end, he finally makes to his destination, which is Alcatraz, which the you know the, w which they closed after those guys escaped in '67, I think it was. That's another robocall. I get them every day. No, you know what they you know what they call me for every day. Your car warranty is up. No, no, every day. My car's leased. It's one year. It's a sixty. I have sixty months bumper to bumper. That's five years. At the end of five years, if I'm still here, I'll get another car. So I, I'm not, you have to renew your, I've told these a hundred times, take me off your list. It's like talking to the wall. So whatever. Back to my story. goes to Alcatraz at the very end of the movie. And he gets through. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's a, you know, he gets there and he has his knapsack and he's, he's willing to die for this thing. And God in the movie, the whole, the whole thing is God protects him. God protects him supernaturally for protecting the book. That's the, whole, that's the whole gist of it. When he gets on the rowboat, I know he doesn't quote it exactly right, but he gets on the rowboat and he's going off to Alcatraz, which is the, his final destination. He does, it's not Alcatraz. It's, they've taken it over. And, he, you know, he's with uh, the other person, what do I think? And he goes, halt! And the, guard, the guards have the, you know, AK-47s that are pointing at him or whatever it was, AR-15s, and he's like, what do you got there? You know, he goes, well, I have the only copy of the King James Bible. That's what he says. I have the, the only one, the King James Bible. I mean, that's powerful. He, come in! Because they have a library. They're trying to restock the world's books because of what had happened. I know there's other books on there. But the point is, he said that on a movie. The King James Bible. I love that he said that. Isn't that great? Just that alone. When Phil and I heard that, just that statement alone, I was like, I love that. That was just so classic. And you know what? That's what it'll be. Get rid of the book. Because the words are absolute. Yeah, he's, been doing, he's been doing good on it. That's why people get scared of the Bible. Because the words are truth. They're powerful. They're absolute. Anyway, so the words are acceptable. They're absolute. And finally, they're authoritative. Look at, look at uh, Acts 26. And I mean, I just, I, I, I personally, I happen to love Denzel Washington. He's a great actor. But I enjoyed that movie, especially that part at the end. It was like, and the first time seeing it, I have no idea what he's going to say. And he comes out, and, and the whole thing was, Larry, it was in Braille. Because he's blind. He says, you walk by faith, not by sight. And he's blind. And, and you don't know that he's blind because he's fighting during the movie. He's, he's incredible. But he's, his hearing is super sunny. You know, it's, it's a movie. And he's blind. But they, he, and then when they finally get it, they realize they can't do anything with it because it's brown. Except the guy that has it. So then they, they're, able, they're, able, they're able to translate it. Verse for ver word for word. All right, lastly. Acts 26. Acts 26, verse 19. Amen. Talking about 
the words of truth. Fellows back there, you got that? David, the words of truth, that's the name of the title, the name of the message. So Acts 26, look at verse 19. This was the message. This was Paul's mission. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to pick it up at verse 19. But this was the Apostle Paul's mission. And he says in 19, it's a great verse. Uh, watch. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, <clears throat> he was given an account to King Agrippa, I was not, I love this, disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Because what he was talking about when he got blinded on the road to Damascus. And how at that moment his life changed 180 degrees. Amen. Completely. Complete turnaround. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. That's the verse I was trying to think of Sunday when I was I got mixed up. It was meat, meat for repentance. That's it right there. See that? That's what repentance is, by the way. Repent and turn to God and do works meet, proper, acceptable for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first, that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. <clears throat> and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. That was a famous line my grandmother said, told me, in Italian. You learn the Bible, you go, you go crazy, Joseph, you go crazy. You can't, you read the Bible, you go nuts. You make, you know, uh, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth. The words of what? Truth. truth and soberness. I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Look at verse, look at verse 28. The close right here, verse 28. What a great verse. And King Agrippa, then King Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Wow, man, close, but no cigar. I mean, he was, Agrippa was on, was at the edge of his seat, like, you almost got me, Paul. I mean, it was, I was like right there. But he's got to recount and think now, if I come out for Christ, to, you know, it's all, that's politician, counting the cause. They're not going with what they know in the heart is true. They're going by what's expedient. What, what, what's going to happen to me? What's my position? Like Judas, he's innocent. I find no fault in the man three times. So why are you going to condemn him? Well, I don't want a rebellion on my hand. Then they're going to throw me out of office. All right, so one guy is going to, maybe they'll release him. I got a great plan. I'm going to pull up Barabbas. They're going to, they're going to release, they're going to release Jesus. Barabbas is a murderer. Come on. It's a brilliant plan. Hey, Pilate had a great plan. It didn't work. Because he dishonored what he knew when his heart was true. Same thing here. Agrippa knew it was true what Paul said. He just wasn't ready. He almost, he almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Almost. Preached a message years ago about uh, almost. Yeah, I was in the Philippines. I preached that message. Almost. Almost uh, isn't good enough. And he, almost Christian. and Almost repented. Almost got saved. and you know, Went like that. But what's the thought here is this. Verse 25. One more time. He said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He was talking to Festus here. Agrippa was chapter 22, the king. But the idea is that when you speak the words of truth, you might be a little crazy, but that's not crazy. And when you say the words of truth, that's authoritative. The words of truth are authoritative. It's the final authority. That's what makes... Bible preaching sometimes difficult to swallow if you if someone's not willing to accept a final authority. They want to view everything as comparative. Let, let me compare with this. And let me see what that says. And let me. It's all gray. Yeah, it's not black or white. It's not yes or wrong, right or wrong. You know, up or down. And Je Jeremiah is another one with with the king Zedekiah's princes and people. He says for they said well, they they were gonna they were gonna kill him. Jeremiah said, you want to kill me? Kill me. You have blood on your hands. All right? He tells me, he says, but here's what he said. But for truth, 
the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. He says that after. He says, now if you guys want to kill me, kill me, but the blood will be on your hands. Because, he says, because for truth, I'm going to speak all these words of truth in your ears that the Lord hath sent me to give you. And, and then they backed off and they didn't kill him. Thank God. And Jeremiah was bold. He said, listen, you want to kill me? I'm just telling you what the tr truth said. Zedekiah kept wanting to know from Jeremiah, did the Lord show you anything? Tell me what the Lord said. He said, Jer Zedekiah, I've told you so many times. Yes, here's the deal. He laid out and Zedekiah still wouldn't listen. So they knew it was true. They didn't act upon it. It's authoritative. Sometimes people know the word of God is right. They just don't want to hear it. Because you said, like you said, it, they, they, they become more accountable. I mean, they're still going to get an account anyway, but the more you hear, then you become more accountable. She's saying, I, I don't want to hear that. I don't, I don't want, I don't, uh, I uh, no, leave me alone. I want to do what I want to do. If I hear that, then I might get too convicted. <laughs> it might, I might have to change something. I don't like that. When Jesus was being approached by the, uh, the temple guards and the Roman guards, rather, to arrest him, well, the priest, right? They arrest him in Gethsemane. And they come to him at night. It's pitch black. It's three in the morning, so they don't, you know. Who is this? Judas says, I'll betray him with a kiss. So as Judas goes to betray him with a kiss, they're coming out with the lanterns and they say, are you the Christ? As they get, I am he. I am. It's just, he said, I am. I mean, think about that. Talk about words being authoritative. What happened to those guys? They fell backward. Someone spoke to them and said they hit with a hydrogen bomb or something. They fell backward. You could speak to somebody. You're not, they're not going to fall backward. He said, I am. And the, the authority, the power, it just they fell backward. At that moment, you got to say to yourself, man, they, you took a lot of guts and gall to get back up and arrest him after that. Ear, the ear. I, exactly. Malchus gets his ear chopped off. These, this guy falls down. It's like, man, you guys know something's going on here. And sometimes that's the way it is. Sometimes people are they're bent on doing, doing what they want to do regardless of what God shows them. But that's showing you the words of truth are acceptable, absolute, and they're authoritative. When I say authoritative, you know, when you read the Word of God, it's authoritative. And you're reading truth. You're re and you're taking it in. It's, 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 it has authority over your spirit. And the, when we don't read it or choose not to, we miss out on that authority that God wants to impart into us to help us combat what we're dealing with. Deal with the spirits of the world and deal with, deal with your own mind and deal with your own worries and fears and give you courage to go forward. If you don't have the words of truth being certain, what do you have? Then you have fables. You don't know what's real. We know it's true. And when you, yeah, you know, if you don't believe, and we believe it's true and you know it's true and that's good, then, then read it as such. Um, turn with me to First Thessalonians for a minute. And then we'll close here. First Thessalonians chapter two verse thirteen. First Thessalonians two thirteen. But that, that's another again, just saying the words are acceptable, they're absolute, and they're authoritative. Absolute, you know they're absolute because you can't add to them. Can't change them. He warns against it. Three times in, in the Bible warns against it. So don't mess with the word of God. And that's why it's you know. Whatever anybody has done, they have to give an account for. You've got to give an account for you. So much the word of God. Read it, leave it as it is, and learn as best you can. You're not going to figure it all out. It's okay. I'd rather be wrong with the right Bible than not. And be wrong in some things, not, not know, know it all. But that's okay. You've you got the right book, and God will honor that. Amen? All right, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause... Also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in what? Truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you the believe. What a great verse. You didn't receive it as just, oh, man wrote the Bible. It's, well, no, they're English, the words that man uses to communicate thoughts and ideas. So yes, in that sense, they're words of men, but they're God's words that man wrote. Right. It's God's words. Man wrote it. Well, he didn't write it in, in hieroglyphics that we couldn't understand. How is anybody going to get blessed from that? 
He's writing it in a language we understand. But we received it. We didn't receive it as the word of men, but as is in truth the word of what? God. Words of truth. The authoritative. Absolute. And they're, they're acceptable. They're acceptable for us to read and meditate on. That's why you should have a, a, a Bible verse in your head. A daily verse, chapter, a proverb, a few psalms, or whatever you're reading in the Bible, whatever your routine is. Read. Get a few verses in your head and your heart before that day goes. And that's important to do. So keep that in mind. That's the uh, words of truth, again, are acceptable, absolute, and finally authoritative. Amen. All right, let's pray. Ask God to help us and dismiss us with his blessing. Lord, I pray you'd be with us tonight. Get us home safe. Uh, be with those who are going through physical recoveries like Brother Ray. Thank you for Renee. Didn't have cancer. And we pray for that Eddie uh, that works for Rose's son who got hurt in an accident. We pray you heal him up. Be with others that are in church that we haven't seen in a while. Bring them back in. Those that have either wandered away or Maybe are feeling well, or maybe are battling depression, or maybe are dealing with uh, some sort of illness that is only known to them. I pray you might encourage your hearts and get them back in church. Help us, Lord Father, be thankful that we can believe the Word of God is truth, and it's truth for our soul, it's spiritual food that gives us courage and power to carry on for you. So thank you, be with us, Lord, cover us with your precious blood, keep us safe, dismiss us with your blessing and unite us again safely in your presence on Sunday. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.